Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here at Trailathletics.com and today we're going to break down Tyler Glasnow's mechanical transformation from a 94 mile an hour guy with the Pirates to an upper 90s guy with the Tampa Bay Rays. I'm sure we're all familiar with Glasnow uh, this postseason, but I want to get, kind of get into the nitty gritty with how he was able to make this mechanical transformation and uh, some of the things that we notice in breaking down his mechanics. Uh, but first, if you guys are new to the channel and you're not already subscribed, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. We're all about helping pitchers develop velocity uh, through strength training, mobility, uh, nutrition and mechanical uh, work as well. So go ahead and subscribe. With that being said, let's get into the video. So we actually ran a poll on Twitter the other day where we put up this side by side of him from 2020 uh, versus 2016. And we asked people, you know, what do you see mechanically different between the two? And we got a ton of responses. But uh, first, if you guys want to see more about what we're doing on social media, definitely follow us on Twitter. I'll make sure to put that up here as well uh, to get kind of previews on some of this content before it comes out here on YouTube. Uh, let's get through some quick facts first. He's six foot eight. He's listed at 225. Uh, to me, it looks like he's gotten a little bit more size on him uh, since when he was listed at 225. But uh, we're just going to go with that. He's 27 years old. He debuted in 20. 16 with the Pirates um, and I kind of want to go through his uh, kind of statistical progression here from 2016 through 2017 2018 um, just to really show how impressive of a transformation he's been able to make um, so we're gonna look at strikeouts per nine hits per nine and walks per nine so how many guys is he striking out how many walks is he giving up and how many hits is he, is he allowing so 2016 he was striking out 9.3 per nine uh, we contrast that to 2020, he's striking out 14.3 per nine. If we look at hits given up per nine, in 2016 it was 8.5, 2017 it was 11.8, so he's given up quite a few hits. Um, 2019 and 2020, it's 5.9 hits per nine and 6.8 hits per nine, so he's given up way less hits than before. Uh, let's look at walks per nine. In 2016, five walks per nine. 2017, 6.4 walks per nine. 2018, it gets significantly better. It's only 4.3 walks per nine. We'll get back to that in a second. 2019 and 2020, when he's really kind of broken out of his shell, 2.1 walks per nine. 3.5 walks per nine. If we go back to 2018, and which is when he went to the Rays uh, midway through the year, we can really kind of break down his the first half of the year with the Pirates and the second half of the year with the Rays. He walked 5.5 guys per nine the first half of the year with Pittsburgh. As soon as he joined the Rays, he walked 3.1 guys per nine for the entire rest of the season. So a really stark difference between his time with the Pirates and his time with the Rays. If we look at kind of his totals for his career between both teams, uh, obviously, you know, there's more variables going on than just mechanics and, you know, we don't necessarily know the whole story, but he was 3-11 and with the Pirates, a 5.79 ERA, 141 innings pitched, 150 hits, 91 walks, only 152 Ks, a 1.7 whip, that's walks and hits per innings pitched, uh, 9.6 hits per nine, so over an inning, over a hit per inning given up, 5.8 walks per nine, almost six walks per game, and 9.7 strikeouts per nine, so pretty good from a strikeout rate. Um, but with the Rays, 12 and 7, 3.32 ERA, 173 innings, and 231 strikeouts, only 125 hits given up, only 55 walks, a 1.04 whip, six, six and a half hits per nine, 2.9 walks per nine, 12 strikeouts per nine. So he's basically gone from a below average pitcher to an all-star caliber pitcher between his time with the Pirates and his time with the Rays. So what about that can we kind of identify mechanically that's changed that could contribute to what's going on? So clearly a lot has changed, but let's break down uh, the fastball velocity differential and his pitch usage uh, differential as well uh, before we get into the mechanics to see what's going on. So his four seam has gone from 93.9 miles an hour average to 97.6 miles an hour on average. So he's gained over three miles an hour on his average fastball velocity, which is quite significant. Uh, his changeup has bumped up a couple miles an hour. His curveball has bumped up over three miles an hour as well. Um, but his overall pitch usage is about the same as it was. So just at a glance, it doesn't look like kind of his profile as a pitcher has changed as much as everything has just been playing up as his, velo as his velocity increased on his fastball and his off-speed pitches have gotten nastier as well. So significantly, uh, significantly more nasty with his pitch offerings at this point. Um, but I want to kind of go through mechanically what he's doing different now versus before. So the first big one is going to be his leg lift. Now, if we kind of slow it down on the left, we can see that during his leg lift, he's moving athletically and he's getting that drift that we talk about. So he's moving his center of mass very, very slightly forward. But you'll notice he's actually staying stacked or level with his pelvis. So he's got that back leg underneath him and he's level with that pelvis. That's going to be incredibly important as we get into the next piece. If we look at the right, the very first thing that he does is he tips the pelvis. This is one of the velocity killers that we talk about. It's that first domino as my buddy Lance Wheeler talks about that if you don't get this first move right, it's very difficult to recover later on in the throw because you've set the, set the events in motion that are gonna lead to you know, how the rest of the throw unfolds. So from the very first step, 
he, tilt, he tips his pelvis forward. And what I mean by tipping the pelvis is this angle right here. He's basically leaning backwards. He's taking that bowl and he's beginning to tip it uphill. Whereas on the left, he's still stacked. He's got that pelvis underneath him. And that's gonna allow him and set him up for at least the ability or the chance to actually get into an effective hinge and effective linear move. But if the very first move is to just tip the pelvis, it's very difficult to recover from that point onward. So uh, leg lift, again, incredibly important starting domino to what we're gonna break down next. So let's look at the next domino now, which is gonna be his forward move. Now, most of you know that we divide the lower half into kind of this, uh, this three parts. There's the drift or the leg lift, right? We look at the center of mass. That's kind of part one. He's, he's moved his center of mass. Part two is this rotational hinge or this linear move, right? That's part two. So part one, part two. Part three is the rotation. So part, part three is that rotation or that unload into landing. And I'm just very, very generally here approximating the center of mass from leg lift to linear move to unload. But you can basically kind of divide the lower half or divide the, the, the delivery into those three, those three pieces. Leg lift, we've talked about what you're ideally looking for with the drift and the stacked pelvis. Now linear move, this is kind of, in my opinion, this is the biggest difference between his mechanics before and after. So he, as he's coming out of the leg lift, there's not necessarily much tension in that rear glute yet because he's kind of just floating into his leg lift. There's not a ton of weight on the back leg yet, but as soon as he comes down out of leg lift, right here, as soon as he drops into that backside, now he's loaded up this back glute. So he's closed with the pelvis, again, extremely important. We talk about this on just about every video, it seems like, because we're breaking down 100 mile an hour throwers and they basically all do this, um, but he's, winding tension and he's building tension into the glute here. So this is when he actually hits the glute as he comes down out of leg lift. It's not necessarily during the initial leg lift, but it's as you come down, now you find the glute and that's what guides you through that entire linear move. I'm kind of demonstrating here the pelvis. Again, the pelvis you can think of as like a bowl, but that pelvis, you're riding that glute through the entire linear move. So what does he do? He's not pushing off the back leg. Instead, he's holding that hinge and he's moving down the mound while holding this coil in the back hip. He's holding this knee and hip flexion and he's riding forward. He's not pushing off or extending forward. Now where's the upper half as he's doing this? So as the hips, as the hips go, as he holds connection to this back foot, the head actually stays back. The head stays stacked and back over the back hip. So his head's not coming out with him. He's holding the head back as the hips go forward. And he's, again, we talked about this level pelvis. Let's track the pelvis. Pelvic angle. Pelvic angle. Pelvic angle. Pelvic angle. Pelvic angle. So he's keeping the pelvis level as he moves forward. He's keeping stacked. He's keeping uh, his, his pelvis underneath him. And so that's really the feeling that we try to communicate with our athletes is keeping that stacked pelvis as you move forward versus tipping and falling towards the target. So we look on the right, again, we already know that the first move is tipping. His pelvis is already here. From there, it's very tough to recover from that position. So watch what happens. He's basically just falling. And so he's falling because you only have so much hip abduction in your back hip, right? So if I stand here and I lift my leg out to the side, there's only so much range that I've got. Maybe that's 25, 30 degrees, there's only so much. So now let's pretend that's now the foot is fixed to the ground and we're tipping the pelvis and that's our first move. It's the same exact thing as just standing here and doing that. So you've actually given up all the available hip abduction, all that range of motion in the back hip already just from that first move being to tip the pelvis. So now he basically falls. He falls towards the target. He finally gets that pelvis back to level. But you can see his pelvis starts very uphill and then at landing, now he gets it back to level. It starts up here and he basically just falls back into landing and eventually gets that pelvis underneath him at landing. But by that point, it's kind of too late. He's missed out on this window of opportunity to actually create that linear move towards the target. And this is why, you know, when we did this Twitter poll, everyone basically can identify this. It, it looks like he's not using his legs. No one, you know, everyone says he's not using his legs, but this is what that really means. He's missing out on the linear move and he's missing out on this capacity to actually get a load and an unload from the pelvis because he's missed out and he's just falling towards the target. Now he does a number of things well after this point, which allows him to still throw you know, 94 on the right. 
but again, he's missed out on that forward move and that hinge, which is, you know, in my opinion, one of the most misunderstood and important pieces uh, of the pitch and delivery when it comes to creating sustainable and effortless velocity. So again, that to me is the biggest and starkest difference between his before and after mechanics. So now I want to get through uh, two other pieces to his lower half and his, his rotational unload into landing. Um, and then I want to actually show an interview with Glasnow where he explains his before and after mechanics, right? A pitcher's feel, what they're actually internally thinking isn't always the same as their real, what they're actually doing. Uh, but I do want to kind of break down that video for you guys and just kind of see if those things align, see if what he's actually doing now versus before lines up with what he's trying to do or what he's feeling internally. So uh, we're gonna break that down as well. Um, but the two things that I do wanna mention as he gets into his unload are, one, there's this, this angle that we often use, um, you know, in kind of describing a pitcher's, uh, how lateral he's able to get, the lateral angle of force he's able to put into the rubber. So when you are able to hold that linear drive longer and hold into the ground longer and keep the head back and ride that stack pelvis longer, what happens is you, as a byproduct of that, is you create a much more lateral angle, right? It's, it's almost like a greater than sign. When you don't do that, when you kind of just tip, fall, and leak forward without any active uh, kind of contribution from the lower half, it's hard to create very lateral angles off the backside. This is kind of the extent of the angle that he creates. If we look at his greater than sign, he's creating a much, uh, a much greater lateral force and much greater lateral angle uh, into, the, into his ground reaction force. And he's very upright and most of this force is just going straight down into the ground. He's not creating that lateral angle because he's not riding the lower half and grabbing the ground with that back foot and keeping the head back and doing all these other things we're talking about. This is just kind of an indicator. This is a symptom downstream of doing, you know, an effective leg lift and an effective linear move and an effective load of the pelvis. But it's just something to look for. If you see this angle on a pitcher, a lot of times that's kind of a symptom that they're doing something wrong earlier on in the throw. If we kind of look a little bit closer at what the back foot is doing, I think this is one of the most, uh, most telling differences before and after. On the left, from the very start, right, you can actually see these front two cleats. So what that tells me is that he's really emphasizing keeping his weight on his heel and specifically it's the inside of the back heel that we you know, constantly harp on with our athletes. If you can get that weight on the inside of the back heel, you have a much better chance of actually finding that glute and finding that effective pelvic load. And so we're able to see these, these front two cleats kind of off of the ground for most of the throw there. But as he rides it forward, you'll notice that foot is firm, 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 firm. And then even as he begins to go into his unload, that foot is still flat and firm on the ground. So he's really, he's holding that foot firm as his center of mass goes forward. And eventually as his pelvis begins to go, that foot is now in relative inversion, right? So his back foot is really holding the ground as much as possible. Now as the pelvis goes, now the pelvis begins to unwind. Watch the back foot. The back foot turns over into eversion. So it's holding the ground, holding the ground, holding the ground, holding the ground, holding the ground. Pelvis goes, back foot flips over into eversion. So it's an inversion to eversion. It's not a triple extending, pushing off, um, you know, ankle kick, anything like that. But what does he do on the right? On the right, he's falling and that back foot just pivots up and over. There's no holding the ground and then flipping over into eversion. It's just pivoting up and over. And so that's again, a telltale sign that the athlete doesn't understand how to stay into the backside. This tends to be, again, a symptom, uh, not the actual cause. Sometimes it can be the cause. Sometimes there's an ankle or a foot issue that prevents a guy from actually holding their backside properly. But more times than not, it's an inability or a misunderstanding of how to actually uh, load and unload the pelvis. So again, just two more interesting you know, pieces that, that we noticed. But let's take a look now at Glasnow in his own words, uh, you know, what, what changes he made. I'd say the biggest adjustment for me the past few years has been, I just think being able to like solidify my mechanics and like what I want to do. My main goal is obviously to, to get rid of all thought while I'm doing it, like trying to be athletic as possible. So interesting point there um, when he's saying he's just trying to get rid of all thought and be as athletic as possible. Um, to me, that implies that he's been kind of coached out of that at certain times in his career where he was really actively concerned with what he was doing, whether that's his lower half or his arm path or throwing strikes. Um, he's trying to get to that point where it's just automatic and he's feeling athletic down the mound. Um, there was a quote in one of the World Series broadcasts where they said he's trying to basically there's a quote from him, he's trying to feel like he's dancing down the mountain, and that's, that's so true, that's how we try to cue and teach this with our athletes. And so if you can get it to where your delivery is kind of this automatic uh, piece in your brain, it's, it's subconscious, um, where it's not having this kind of internal, internal focus on where your arm is in space, where your foot is, where your hips are, and it can just be this flowing dance move, 
that's when you've gotten to a repeatable and a sustainable delivery uh, relative to kind of the over analytical, uh, constantly feeling a robotic type mentality. So uh, just very interesting. It seems like that's part of what has allowed him to evolve is getting away from that. I think within like that practice mindset, I think a couple of things I think about are um, obviously I kind of do that weird thing. I don't know why it just feels good. I get up, I kind of feel like I do this weird little hip hinge thing. So I feel like I'm getting into my, to my hips. I used to get very like f across my body. And so like when I feel like I come up like this, I'm like reinforcing the, the sitting motion. Very interesting, and again, this is something that we've seen with uh, with certain athletes. Um, specifically, one of our coaches. This was a this was a cue of his. Um, you know, he went from a low 90s guy to mid to upper 90s, and this was something that he did in his initial preload is just try to kind of reinforce that mind muscle connection to his hip hinge to his glute. Um, so I have seen that work for other guys as well. So I get up, come here. I want to feel like pretty compact and tight. Like I almost want to feel like there's a little window here. So I have like this. I want to feel like everything that I do within my lift is like in this box. So I'm not going this way. I'm not like whatever it may be. I feel like everything is compact here and I'm lifting this to my shoulder like straight up and I want to be as linear as possible. Instead of coming like around it or getting on the side of it, it's good for me to just kind of start here, feel really compact and everything's kind of close to my body. And then once I kind of feel that balance, I want to sit into my hip this way, not like a coming across it or anything. That's what a lot of guys can kind of get messed up on. But uh, it's pretty simple. The only, really the only two things I think about it. Okay, so first off, he's talking about, he calls it staying compact during his leg lift. Um, the way that we talk about it is we talk about it as kind of staying stacked during the leg lift. In other words, during the leg lift, there shouldn't be a ton of uh, postural shift happening. So from the front, right, he's staying stacked over his center of mass. It's a simple leg lift. He's not leaning backwards. He's not tipping forwards. He's not leaning back towards second base. He's not tipping forward towards home, but it's staying stacked over the pelvis. And so for him, he needed to think kind of that this term compact, um, you know, we kind of refer to this as just staying stacked, keeping the head over the pelvis, keeping the pelvis level. But are keeping it in the box and then having that hinge pattern towards the mound. So I want my momentum, everything going towards the catcher as opposed to like coming off this way or staying closed too long. So that's all you gotta do to get 100 miles an hour? Yeah, that's it. That's so what he's talking about there in terms of being as linear as possible, a lot of pitchers don't actually need to actively ever focus on the rotational phase. Again, we broke down the, the lower half into kind of those three main buckets. But for a lot of pitchers, that rotation happens naturally. It's just really, it's holding that linear move as long as they can and then releasing it at the last second and just letting it flow. And the rotation oftentimes just happens or it should happen absolutely naturally. And so what he's explaining is he's just trying to hold that linear move towards the plate as long as possible. And that's the idea of the hinge. The hinge actually gains you directionality towards your throw. If you can find that back hip, and hold that back hip and the glute with a level pelvis and ride it towards the target, it gives direction to your throw versus trying to rotate out of your, out of your lower half early. He's trying to hold that linear move as long as possible because he knows it gives him direction and it gives him that later unload into the target. One more thing about your delivery. You're one of the best at staying back on the backside and utilizing your legs. Uh -huh. What's the key to that for you? How do you do that so well? So, that was like the biggest thing I struggled with early on. Like the consistency had everything to do with my backside. So as a pitcher, everything starts with your first motion. It does, like you said, it kind of starts with everything over the rubber. Again, interesting that he said everything starts with your first motion. I think he's, he's aware that his leg lift with the Pirates was kind of that first domino that was impacting the rest of the throw. And so he's really talking about if I can have an effective, efficient leg lift that sets me up to get into my glutes, then I have a better chance of actually getting down the mound and transfer that energy effectively. Um, the second I kind of got into, like it really started in the weight room as opposed to when you're younger and you're lifting, it's like get your legs strong, get your core strong. So me being, I was like, I'm just gonna squat a bunch and do a bunch of sit-ups, right? right? Like More muscle. Exactly, right, yeah. so I just started, I'm like 6'8 already and then I got like super heavy loaded quads, super heavy loaded front side and it was always like taking me this way. So this actually is more common than you think. There is such a thing as being quad dominant versus a kind of glute or posterior chain dominant. So if all you ever do is quad dominant lifts, it's not to say that's the one variable that can be blamed on not learning a proper hinge because he still could have done a much better job. But a lot of times it can make it harder for athletes to learn and feel it if they don't have a good mind muscle connection uh, to their posterior chain because all they've been doing is reinforcing quad dominant movement. So um, when it comes to an actual training plan, it is important like he's talking about to have a balance of posterior 
posterior chain versus kind of quad dominant movements. Posterior chain being your glutes, your hamstrings, things like glute ham raises, deadlifts, RDLs, uh, things that build up the posterior chain, not just from a strength standpoint, but from a mind muscle connection standpoint. That's kind of one of the less talked about and underappreciated benefits from strength training is improving the ability to turn on and contract and that mind muscle connection with different muscles uh, that you're training in the weight room on a daily basis. Like everything was always quad dominant and I'm falling forward. And this Notice he said he was falling forward. Again, we talked about that. He seems very aware of his patterns and some of the issues he was having before falling forward. Second, um, I started to kind of change the way I lifted and like get into like the hip hinge pattern. I realized I was going across too much. And I needed to have like that stability like driving off my flat foot this way as opposed to coming up this way. So important if you guys miss that, he's literally just talking about that ankle inversion to eversion, letting the pelvis ride as linear as, as, as long as he can. And then as he rotates, having that back foot turn over as opposed to popping up and over. Um, so again, he seems very, very aware of what's going on. He's clearly, uh, you know, kind of been in the loop with, with his, his own biomechanics. Uh, you know, so he, has, he has an idea of what's going on. So um, just interesting that what his feel is and what he's been working on is directly in line with what he's actually able to do. So I just started the like heavy deadlifting and like a lot of hip mobility, a lot of hip single leg stuff, like feeling stable within my hips. But that the biggest thing that's helped me is, is the hinge pattern, like feeling like I'm sitting in a chair as opposed to like coming across this way. So again, the hinge pattern, um, you know, he kind of describes it as just sitting in a chair. That can work really well for guys, especially if as they're sitting in a chair, they know to keep the pelvis closed. And it kind of creates that rotational tension in the back hip automatically for a lot of guys. For some guys, when they just think sitting in a chair, it still opens them up early. And so they have to think like, not just sit front to back, but sit and add that coil. And he did mention that he's been doing a lot of hip mobility work as well. I'm interested to hear, you know, specifically what type of hip mobility work? Is he working on that hip internal rotation so he can hold that coil longer? Is he working on opening up his groin in abduction so that he can maintain that connection to the backside longer? We see that all the time with our remote athletes is if they come out of the backside early, a lot of times it's actually a groin limitation. They don't have that flexibility in their groin and their adductors to hold that backside as long as possible. Um, so I'm interested to hear, you know, uh, if anyone knows kind of what type of hip mobility work he's been doing. Right, so when you come up with your leg lift, all right, you do squat a little bit to engage yeah, the backside. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So it's, but that's the thing. I think it's more of like a mentality thing. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect with it. Like I'm not fully straight. I'm still a little across. But it's the mentality of like staying stable and then going forward this way, engaging your backside yes. and leading with the hip. Hundred percent. Right? Again, last thing, just super subtle, but. Um, you know, I tweeted a video of Pedro Martinez kind of teaching and, uh, you know, a clinic on the hip hinge and teaching what that pelvic load looks like. But it's just really interesting to see, uh, see a high level thrower who, you know, throws 100 miles an hour demonstrate uh, in their mind what that looks like when they're just kind of demonstrating a super low effort rep. You can see he's not pushing through the quad. He's not extending that back leg or trying to triple extend. He's actually just finding the hinge and he's, he's riding it forward while staying stacked. Just super interesting when you see an elite thrower just demoing what, they're, what they think they're doing with their lower half. And again, it's reinforcing everything that we're seeing in full game speed as well. So, you know, again, just wanted to break down that video for you guys. A lot of times there, there is a mismatch when you talk to a pitcher, what are you thinking, what are you trying to do versus what they actually do in the game. Um, but for him, it's, it's very much directly in line, which again, super interesting. All right, so the final point I wanna make about his mechanics is in regards to his arm swing or his arm path. Uh, it's not something that he touched on in that video. I'd be curious to know what conscious changes he might've made to his arm action. But again, if we kind of go through the video on the left, what you'll see and what a lot of people pointed out on the initial poll that I put on Twitter is that it's a much longer arm swing. And not saying that in a bad way, but if we look at the length of that arm swing, he's really letting that rhythm of the handbrake take that arm down and around and up that spiral staircase and into that high cocked scap loaded position. He's in full scap retraction, horizontal abduction, and he's captured that energy into this flowing loop of energy. He's in a great position here to actually apply force to the baseball at the right time. If we go on the right, we can see that he's really actively trying to keep that arm action as short as possible. He's breaking the hands much higher and he's just coming kind of basically straight up into the high cock position. So it's a much shorter arm path. And it's just one of those things where, you know, a lot of people nowadays kind of are on this fad that shorter is always better. Here's a shorter arm path. And, you know, he's still up on time, but he's getting less scap retraction. He's getting less scap loading. The way that he gets into that position is important too. It's not just about getting into a static position. It's how you get into that position. So if we're trying to get to, let's say a scap loaded arm up, you know, front side close at landing position. We can get there a bunch of different ways. We can get there by just immediately yanking into that position, or we can get there by actually flowing through and dynamically passing through that position 
so that that loop of energy is actually sustained and that we can use that to accelerate better into ball release. And so again, it's how we get into that position. He doesn't really capture a good loop of energy into that landing position. He's kind of just going very short, being very compact. And I just think the lesson here is that shorter is not always better. We're gonna do another video at a, at a later date about this. But again, there's very much this fad in the pitching world that everyone has to shorten their arm action because Lucas Giolito did and it worked for him. I just think we gotta be aware of that longer can be better or worse, shorter can be better or worse. It's much more about how you get into those positions, how you flow through those patterns, and whether those screw up or help your sequencing, and whether those align with the lower half and the tempo of the rest of the delivery or don't. And so here's a case where he's got a longer arm swing, but it's perfectly synced up and matched to his current lower half. It's benefiting his sequencing rather than hurting it. Again, just goes to show that it's not always a black and white situation where if a pitcher's having an issue, just shorten his arm action. It doesn't work that way for every guy that it helps we see two or three guys that it hurts. So we just need to be very careful about making changes, especially if a guy is having success. If he's not having success, again, that's a conversation to have. That's a conversation we have with our remote athletes quite a bit when they're having mechanical issues. But again, just wanted to point out his arm path that longer is not necessarily worse, and it can actually be significantly better if that's what matches up for that guy's sequencing, rhythm, tempo, lower half. So you made it to the end of the video and you're probably wondering, well, wait a second, he's doing all these things wrong on the right and yet he was still sitting 94 and now he's doing everything better and he's sitting 98, but you know, how was he even able to throw 94 on the right in the first place with you know, barely using his lower half how he was supposed to? And you know, the answer is he's still doing a lot of things right. We look at over 55 different variables when we break down pitchers. You know, he's still doing a, quite a few things right despite the flaws that I mentioned. So he's still doing a good job of getting his arm up on time. He's keeping his trunk relatively closed at landing. He's leaking forward a little bit with the head, but he's keeping it closed. Uh, he's getting downhill through the ball, so he's not landing uphill. He's getting exceptional layback still. He's still getting great trunk extension over his front leg. He's still creating a very effective lead leg block. Oh, and by the way, he's six foot eight, so he's got extremely long levers as well, and he's an extremely gifted athlete. So he still had a lot going for him, which is why he was able to still be you know, an average or below average big leaguer with all these issues going on. But that begs the question, and I just want to kind of bring up, uh, bring up this, this point for you guys to think about. You know, let's say this is the A-plus version of Glasnow's mechanics, and let's say this was kind of like the B-minus version of his mechanics. Still doing th some things well, but you know, here he's sitting 98, here he's sitting 94. You know, what, is, what does he look like if we take away a few degrees of layback on the right? What does he look like if we fly him open a couple degrees early? What, was, what does he look like if he pops out of the back leg just a hair earlier, or he softens the front knee just a little bit more? Uh, what does he look like if any of these things that he's doing well, which managed to allow him to stay throwing 94, get just a little bit worse? Like what does the C minus version of glass nose mechanics look like, right? Maybe he's sitting 91, 92. Let's say he's sitting 92 at the C minus version of his mechanics, despite being an exceptionally gifted athlete that everybody would agree on that. How many other Glasnos exist in the minor leagues or exist you know, some, in some D1 school where they're throwing 92, but really that's the C minus version of what they could be. And if you got them to the A plus version of their ideal mechanical patterns, this is really what they could be, right? People like to say that it's all, you know, he's so blessed, he's so, it's just all genetics. And that's true, but they give a lot more credit to it than, than they should. Because the fact of the matter is that he could be throwing six miles an hour slower if his mechanics were sloppy, uh, just a little bit more here, a little bit more there. And so the point is there's a lot of guys out there that are gifted athletes. I've played with a lot of them at every level, especially in college. I played with so many low 90s guys in pro ball that had so much left on the table from a strength training standpoint. You know, they weren't doing anything nutritionally, mobility. They had all sorts of mechanical issues, far worse than we're seeing here in his B minus mechanics. So point being, there's a lot of guys that have a lot more on the table than they're actually able to access right now. And just because they're throwing 90 doesn't mean they're not capable of throwing 98. You don't really know what you're capable of until you maximize all those different check boxes that go into building yourself up to being the best athlete possible. So that's the approach that we take when training our athletes. And I just wanted to throw that out there for you guys to think about how many pitchers out there could be throwing even better, could be healthier, could be sustaining their velocity better, um, you know, if they just maximize their movement quality and how they moved on the mound. So uh, I want to end the video on that, but thanks again for watching. Again, if you guys aren't subscribed, if you got value out of this video, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and we'll be in touch next, next video. See you guys then.